innovation. It's a word you've all used, and I would hazard a guess it's a word you've all been asked to participate in. And it's a word that I've heard countless times, not, la not just in the last talk, but over the last three days, over the last year, over the last decade. Whilst I know that you know what innovation is, I think it's worth going back to the origins of the word, which is based in the Latin word for make new. The frequency of this word has increased over the last 200 years. So this is, this is basically a graph from Google Ngram Viewer, which looks at how many times a word is written in a piece of literature. And we can see that the velocity of the frequency of this, this word has increased since the 1950s. So really when the Industrial Revolu Revolution started, and I find it interesting um, and I would almost argue that previous to that time is when perhaps our nation was at its most innovative. And yet we didn't have to use that word. The thing is, to me, the frequency of this means that the word is starting to lose its meaning. This word is now in the realms of disruption and synergy as a buzzword. And as you all know, it was the catch cry of our Prime Minister's winning campaign. It's a line item in corporate budgets, it's an unclear KPI in many departments, and it's now a job title too. But I'm not here today to tell you what innovation is. Some will say it's giant leaps of invention, and others will argue that incremental improvement is just as valid. Either way, I think we can all agree that unless we're making new, we're not innovating. For the record, my personal opinion lies with the former. I think the creative within me is much more excited and stimulated by the thought of of inventing new things that are, that are really new. Um, but I think, and I think the optimist within me believes that it's going to be these big risk-born ideas and actions and events that will change the world for the better. And I'm pretty sure that's why we're all here doing what we're doing. So that's why, even though I cringe as I say the word, I do still believe in innovation. In 1964, a book called Lucky Country was published. It was described as a damning and bleak assessment of Australian society in the 1960s. It was highly controversial, and the irony of its title was lost on many at the time. Now, I've only recently come across this book, and this is a pretty damning final sentence or paragraph. But to me, it sums up why perhaps Australia is not as innovative as we'd like to think we are. But what I find more interesting is that another paragraph within the book goes on to describe the qualities of Australians. And I think that these qualities are what it takes, they are the core ingredients to head there. We were born of convicts, criminals, rebels and creatives, and some of us were lucky enough to be born of the original survivors of this country. So what happened? What happened to our daring pursuits and our innate desire to bend the rules? At what point did failure become such a dirty word and any success we achieved, together or otherwise, deemed as a, as a threat. Is it that we've become so complacent in nature that our good fortune has now become an expectation and a norm, that there's now not any real driver to make any difference? I have a theory about creativity. I've found that the cities around the world that I most enjoy for their creative culture have something in common, and that something is pretty shit weather, Melbourne included, although today is gorgeous. 
This has become particularly evident to me when I moved from Melbourne to Brisbane, and Brisbane is certainly not lacking in creative talent, but I would argue that the environment needs to try harder to, to really create that creative culture. Because I think that the inhabitants of Brisbane don't have to try very hard to create a great space around them. You can just go for a walk in a beautiful rainforest, or you can head to the beach for a surf almost any day of the year. And I think it's when, whereas in Melbourne, where I've experienced almost every season in one day, we need to make things to do. We need to create the space that we want around us. We need to be deliberate about our actions. It's not just all at our doorstep. We actually need to contribute. And so in turn, I wonder whether this is what's happening with innovation in Australia. Whether we've really ever been in a bad enough position to warrant substantial change from our norms. We may not love our leadership, we may complain about all manner of things, but it's never really gotten that tough to spur us into action. I don't know if I can remember a time when the great majority really got behind anything. Looking at the Global Innovation Index, over the past couple of years, we've slipped another couple of places. And to be, to be honest, we weren't even that high to begin with. The countries that are, that are topping this chart are Switzerland, Sweden, United Kingdom, even the United States of America. And in terms of who's leading the startup count, well, that's Tel Aviv. They've got the most startups per capita, and they're actually succeeding. So what is it that these countries are doing that we could emulate or learn from? How can innovation as a concept and a mandate actually resonate with the wider Australian public? What does show up time and time again when I analyzed these few countries is the quality of and creative approach to education, ease of foreign and local investment, filing patents and protecting IP, government policy, tax incentives, and a general ease of doing business, alongside new leadership that actually consciously tries to encourage and enable experimentation. In Switzerland, 75% of R&D is from foreign investors, and that's because it's so easy to invest there. The British government is investing five times the amount we are in, into innovation, and Singapore, a far smaller country, is investing 18 times. Sweden, alongside my creative weather theory, uh, is known for their decentralized, less bureaucratic government. And I think it's this openness and liberality and equality that they convey that actually gives way to people having ideas and pursuing them. It's that informality. The reasons in Tel Aviv are obviously less desirable, but I think just as deliberate. Their approach to army intelligence is grooming one of the strongest tec technical entrepreneurs in the world. But more importantly than this, I, I believe it's a commitment to progress and learning. Sometimes this is born from necessity, Singapore don't have natural resources to fall back on, and Israel have every motivation in the world to culture the most intelligent army. But obviously, preparing for and defending war is not the answer. Whilst a brilliant motivator, how can we create the impetus, the threat, the driver, the necessity when we've all been told that we're so special, that the world is our oyster, and that we live in such a great country. What is it going to take to ensure we don't follow down the same paths as our Western allies, despite their world innovation ranking? We can see what's happening with the rest of the world. We can see what happens when celebrities turn into public authority, sorry, public figures with terrifying authority. We can see what happens when our fears are appealed to and our comfort levels echo that of the past. 
There's only so much we can look sideways, and we certainly should not be relying on what's always worked. We can't afford to get nostalgic about how things were and the good old days, and whilst history may well repeat itself, we also know that the only way to survive is to continue changing. So I'm sorry, but I'm also not going to tell you how to innovate. It would be like telling you how to be creative. What I can tell you, though, is that it's about true intent and purpose. You can't build upon something you don't know, and you have to believe in its very importance to drive enough motivation to make change and to make new. I know these slides seem pretty full on. We're a lucky country. We lead a very liberal life. We lead le very liberal lives in so many ways. How could our survival possibly depend on a buzzword like innovation? For many, the fear of change is what ceases any daring to make new. For businesses that have thrived on a model that works, the risk in changing is too great. But I see the risk of becoming irrelevant a far greater fear. It's, always, it's what's always driven change within our business, and it's what's worked because we know what's worked. Yesterday will be the death of our business tomorrow. On a professional level, at Joseph Mark, we're moving our traditional fee-for-service model to a ventures model. We've been doing this slowly over the last few years, and over the past ten, we've centered our business around how we create the very best environment for our teams to create and enact upon their ideas. And yet, we've been unable to define our method. We struggle to define our process because that process should not always be repeated. It doesn't take into account that today is and should be different from yesterday. So instead, we have a philosophy. By its very definition, a venture is a daring pursuit, and we're purposely building this mentality within our teams, within our business, as a way of doing business. Because we know that embracing, we know that we need to embrace the risk that is inevitable. And if the risk isn't there, you're probably not doing anything exciting enough. We're building a portfolio of ventures so that we inherently diversify their risk, and we're taking the MVP one step further by creating the MCP to ensure that each and every, each and every venture has a pathway to commercialization. Because you can't sustain a business without making money. Alexander Chung made the great case two years ago at this very conference on this very topic. I'm pretty sure on this very stage. He made the point that we should not emulate America. He was asking the question about whether Australia could become the next Silicon Valley. And I think that point is probably no no truer than now, and that instead the most innovative thing that Australia could do was create a point of view of our own, and focus our creative and innovative economies on issues and topics that deserve to be made better. To me, that's what innovation should be about. It should be about community, not at the expense of capitalism. It should be about equalism, not racism, or, or sexism, or oppression. It should be about collaboration as a weapon against conflict. So let's do more than creating more startups. Though I'm thrilled and excited about this turn of events in Australia, more than creating more ways to consume our minds and time. Though I'm fascinated and stimulated by that very pursuit, let's do more than simply improving things for improvement's sake. Even though I'm constantly striving to make better, we are a lucky country. But I think we're too lucky that we haven't had to turn what we've got into diamonds. We need to focus less on simply keeping up with the world. And more on defining our world. 
I'd really like us to all make new on that. Thank you.